Welcome once again to another video right here at the free Flutter course, the complete free Flutter course in fact, presented by the same person as always, although my camera is off because I don't really look presentable right now, but that's fine. Okay, so really quickly I wanted to talk about the flow of data in this program. And this is going to lead to a really interesting discussion, which is going to be quite important for a lot of you guys. I know a lot of you guys have really wanted to know about this for quite a long time, although you might not have known about it. So this is how our data is going to flow in this app. We have our UI, which we just built out the first part, and our UI is going to end up calling our GetX controller. And in this app, we're going to use the GetX controller, but this could have also have been our block, this could have been our provider, or any kind of um, any kind of state management solution, or we could have also just deleted this and not have anything here, just have a direct relationship between the UI and the next parts. But for now, let's put it back to the GetX controller. And then look at this, so our GetX controller is going to access a local data interface and a remote data interface. So what's going on here? Why am I doing this? Well, I thought that one thing which would be quite cool to do would be to have our app cache previous searches so that we don't always have to use that API. Uh, the main reason I want to do that is simply to demonstrate having a local database, but uh, in a real world application, you could do it to save you know, to save processing power, to save um, uh, to save network, to not need to m download multiple things multiple times. This would be especially useful for images or, you know, anything like that. Or if you want something to be snappier, because of course things are going to be faster if you get it from your local data score store than if you have to make an external request and wait for that response. So what our GetX controller is going to do, um, why don't we add some uh, functions over here so we can see a bit better what we're doing. Uh, I'm going to move this up a bit. I'm not too sure how to use this uh, this thing. So we're going to give a couple functions here. Uh, we're going to have something like search movie, right? And what the search movie is going to do is first is going to query our local data store. First is going to say, hey, do we have this movie, this data in our local data store? If we do, then use the data right here and give it back to the UI. But if this local data store does not have the information I need, then go ahead and get it from the remote data store instead. You know, go ahead and call the API and get me that um, that data. And then after search movie, we're gonna have something like uh, get movie details or search movie detailed or whatever we wanna call it. Um, but I'm just going to call it get movie details. And the, exactly the same thing is going to happen here. First, we're going to query our local data store. And then if we have that data there, we're going to get the data from the local uh, store. But if we do not have this data, we're going to go right ahead and try to get it from the API, from the remote data store, and see what happens in that case. But I know you guys are looking at this graph and you're thinking, Hold on, Avidius. Hold on just a second, Avidius. You're saying local data store, you're saying remote data store, but I'm seeing something called a local data interface and a remote data interface, and purposely twice you've held your mouse over the interface, but then you very quickly moved away. What is up with that? What is up with that? Right. Very good question. So let's go ahead and look at uh, Wikipedia, actually. So an interface... Let's see. Wikipedia says that in computing, an interface is a shared boundary across which two or more separate components of a computer system exchange information. What? <laughs> Excuse me, what? <laughs> the exchange can be between software, computer hardware, peripheral devices, humans, and combination of these. Uh, some computers, computer hardware devices, such as touchscreen, can both send or receive data through the interface, while others, such as a mouse or microphone, may only provide an interface to send data to a given system. Uh, okay, yeah, so I don't understand any of that, but uh, that, that's fine. <laughs> We're going to make our own. Uh, so let's not worry too much about the definition, but I did want to give you the exact definition as well. Uh, essentially, what this is going to mean 
uh, is that our interface is going to allow our GetX controller to talk to our local data store, to our remote data store. You know, something used a lot in clean coding. We can create these kind of interfaces as a boundary, you know, to separate the different things because our local data store, and this could be a few different things, you know, this could be something like, uh, like Hive. This could be something like SQF Lite. I think these are the two most popular choices. Our remote data store could be you know, it could be different APIs. Uh, it could even be uh, like a Firebase backend. It could be uh, our, our own custom API. It could be a number of different things. Um, and what this interface is going to allow us to do is have our GetX controller not be dependent on the local data store. Because think of our local data store or our remote data store. Our local data store could have different code, different functions based on which which database we end up choosing. If we want SQF Lite or Hive, the code is going to be different. So what? Do I need to change my GetX controller based on which database I want to use? Um, maybe, but that's not, it doesn't feel right, right? Especially if uh, like right now, maybe I want to start coding my GetX controller first, and then I just want to make my data stores afterwards. Maybe I haven't even decided which data store I want to use. So that's where these nifty little interfaces come in. Now, what they're going to look like in Dart specifically is they're going to be abstract classes, right? And it's going to be an abstract class, which isn't going to contain any kind of code except for the prototypes for the functions. So our Again, our local data interfaces are just going to have this, uh, the prototypes for the functions, not the functions themselves. So it's going to let our GetX controller and the rest of our code know how we can interface with the local data store, how we can uh, get that data, but it's not actually going to give us the exact code. And the same with the remote data interface. And this leads me back to why I said at the beginning, it's something which I've received a lot of questions about, but you guys probably didn't realize this is the actual use case. Uh, do you remember back in module two, we spoke about the implements keyword and uh, a lot of people asked me, why would I ever want to use implements? What would be the point of using that implements keyword? Well, this is exactly where we would use it. Okay. So now that we know this, let's go ahead and make these interfaces. So opening up my VS code, and I don't need this in not my in presentation in my infrastructure. I'm going to make a new folder called uh, local data store. And I'm going to make a second new folder called remote data store. And my local data store is going to have a new file called local data interface. I could also call it database interface or something like this. A lot of people like to call it database. I could also call it I database. That I stands for interface or I local store. Again, that I stands for interface uh, or anything like that. But in this case, I'm going to go with local data interface dot dot. Okay. And I was about to type in that IMPM just out of habit, but I do not need this actually. We're not going to be using any Flutter in this local data store. We're just going to be using regular Dart. So what I'm going to do is say abstract class. It would help if I can spell local data interface. And quick pop quiz for you guys. What does abstract mean? Why we make this an abstract class? So if you guys remember from module two, an abstract class is a class which we cannot instantiate. We can't create uh, actual instances of this. It's just kind of like that prototype that, um, yeah, that interface. Okay. And let's think of what we need. So I want a search movie function. So that's going to be search movie. And what is this going to take? Well, search movie is going to take a parameter called, it's going to be a string title. And it's also actually going to take an int p. 
page. And I'm just going to do that. Search movie, string title, int page, semicolon. Now, what's up with the semicolon at the end? Well, this is what makes it a function prototype, because normally when writing a function, I would write the entire function over here like this, right? But in this case, I don't have a function body because, you know, it's just a prototype. It's just something to give me, uh, well, that, that interface. So I'm just going to put that semicolon at the end. And you'll notice as well that we don't have a return type yet. For now, I'm going to say dynamic. It's not going to stay dynamic but it's just because that's something I want to talk about in the next video. Uh, so we'll leave that and we'll have one more, which is going to be get movie details. Okay. And this one's going to take a string ID and that's going to be all that it takes. And I'm going to save that. Okay. So you might be wondering what's up with the ins page here and how do I know this is going to take an ID? Well, Let's go back here. So if you guys remember from, from last time, this is the API that we're going to use. And uh, if you guys want to learn how to use the API, the best thing to do is to actually go to that API because you know every API is going to be different. Go to that API and read their specific readme. So over here, it tells us exactly what we need to do. Our usage, send all data requests to uh, this website with the API equals your key and whatever. And we can pass in different parameters. And the parameters that we're interested in, I here, would be a valid IMBD IT, uh, ID. And I have a cust uh, one here. If we search by ID and I search for Star Wars uh, Episode 4, we'll get all this kind of information. On the other hand, we might not always know the ID. Uh, so what we can do instead is search for a movie title. And I'll make this a bit bigger. And that is this T parameter. And guys, we're going to go into much more detail over how to use this API in the future, so don't worry about it. Uh, I'm now just giving you a brief overview. So if we search for the T, instead it's going to give us this, like a list of different results with titles, years, uh, IMBD IDs, and posters, URLs, and that kind of stuff. But the interesting thing is, uh, I searched for Star Wars here, but I only get nine results, okay? But this is zero indexed, so it's actually 10. Um, but notice here, total re results is 556. You know, there's been a lot of different Star Wars movies made, but I'm only getting nine. So what's up with this? Well, that's because we can also include, and I don't know where that is, uh, here. We can also include the page parameter. And what the page parameter is going to do is allow us to, well, I'll just search over here. So by searching Star Wars, I'm on uh, the first result of Star Wars episode four. But what I can also do is say, uh, and P equals two, which did not work the way I expected it to because it was page, not P. And now notice that I start with Solo or Star Wars Story, right? So now I'm getting the second page of results. And this is of course gonna be important to get all the results <laughs> because otherwise we we'll just get the, the same time. So yeah, that's why we need this int page. Okay, so that is our local data uh, interface. And now let's go ahead and make our remote data, remote data interface. Interface dot dot. Okay. And I'm going to put this on the side just so I can see it. Because something interesting is going to happen here. Our remote data interface, how similar do you guys think it's going to be to our local data interface? Let's look back at this diagram I made. What functions am I going to need in my remote data interface? It's the same ones, isn't it? the GetX controller is first going to look at local data store, try to get the data. And if it doesn't have it, it's going to go to the remote data store, but it's actually going to need the exact same functions. So I'm going to need a dynamic search movie string title int page. And I'm going to need a dynamic get movie details. And this is going to take a string ID like this. Okay. So look at this, these two interfaces, 
are identical. <laughs> And you might be looking at this and thinking, Avidius, why are we making two exactly identical things? This doesn't make sense. You're ruining programming. Just you're confusing us for no reason. What is this? Well, it's all going to make sense a lot more in future lectures. Because remember, we spoke about that implements keywords. Uh, we are in the future going to take these different interfaces and make real classes which we can use. And what you'll notice is that although these function prototypes are the same, the contents of the function in the remote data the remote data source and the local data source is going to be extremely, extremely different. And also the way our getx controller interacts with these two different things is going to be different. Although they need to have the same data inside, they're not going to be treated the same way. So this is why actually we do need to have both of them. Okay, so I'm going to end this video here, but in the next video, we're going to talk about this because the return type is not dynamic. This isn't correct, but I just didn't want to overload this video with too many different ideas at the same time. So for now, myself, Avidius, I'm out.